Chablis, Beaujolais, Macon, and the Coach Chalonese today. I would say probably carve out about 20 to 30 minutes for today's presentation. Um, not too overwhelming amount of information when you talk about these sort of smaller regions here. Uh, we'll start with a map of Chablis. Um, this is a, a, a good map, I think, in the way that it shows the Saran, of course, bisecting the region. It shows you the Grand Cru AOP here. You can see sort of the, the Primer Cru's outlined uh, in this darker beige color. And then the lighter color represents just AOP, uh, Chablis and Petit Chablis. Um, and I think you'll notice too, one of the things that I always like to look at when we look at these different uh, Primer Cru regions, you'll notice there are divisions and you'll find other Climat or Primer Cru that sit within each of these, particularly in Montmain, and we'll get to that. Uh, you could see, you know, the Grand Cru AOP for Chablis sits obviously just above the Saran. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about each of the smaller areas within that. Uh, here are the Grand Cru. Um, sort of the best way that I found to remember where uh, each one of these are, if you start with the outside with the two Bs and Bougrot and uh, Blanc Chaud, uh, then you get uh, Prus, Le Clos, and then you get the two Vs in the middle and Val and Valmer before you combine to get to Grand Wee. And of course, the unofficial official uh, Grand Cru of La Mouton uh, that's owned by Domaine Long de Bequit which has since been purchased by Albert Bichot, uh, crosses over Prus and Valdez here, right here. So some general facts about a, uh, excuse me, about Chablis. Uh, of course, there's just a three AOPs. We talked about that being Petit Chablis, Chablis and Chablis Grand Cru. The Primer Crews are uh, listed underneath just Chablis AOP, technically. A few important historical dates uh, for the region. Um, there was a train developed, the train system from Marseille to Paris in 1855. Um, you find powdery mildew stripes in 1886, uh, phylloxera in 1887. Then you get World Wars I and II up to the turn of the century. Of course, uh, at the end of World War II, you get a major frost in 1945. And then another vintage that's completely lost to frost in 1957. Of course, this falls right on the heels of that 1956 vintage. Uh, in Bordeaux, it was completely lost uh, as well. Uh, so basically, you're looking at uh, a region that was reduced to one to two percent of their pre-war totals when it comes to production. Pretty amazing um, decimation. Um, this region, of course, is also the one that created aspersion. Aspersion, for those of you that aren't necessarily as familiar with that particular term, um, is a spraying of water onto your grapes before a freeze sets in in order to encourage the outside to freeze um, and protect the grape that's in the center of that frozen spot, uh, rather than allowing the frost uh, to freeze the juice in the center, if that makes any sense. Hopefully I have, I have explained that properly. Um, as well as the chaufferettes, which are also known as smudge pots. Uh, of course, to, to battle frost and hail, these little smudge pots are things they would light um, in the between rows of vineyards next to grapes in order to raise the temperature during frosts. You start seeing really tractors uh, in the 1950s in Chablis. Today, uh, about 95% of the region is harvested by machine, actually. Uh, the per Primer Crews that we, we mentioned before being part of the, the basic Chablis AOP were added in 1967. Um, the boundaries have, have you know, long been controversial in the wake of popularity. In 2012, you produced over 300,000 hectoliters of wine. The 1938 INAO laws actually originally allowed only for land that overlaid Kimmeridgian marl. <clears throat> um, today you see um, an expansion upon that, of course. So more of the Portlandian soil is utilized. It's a harder cap rock with less clay. It's sandier, thinner than Kimmeridgian. Uh, the clay and limestone, of course, uh, with Kimmeridgian is made up of marl there. Grand Cru's uh, total up to around 100 hectare. Uh, just along the Seren River there. And of course, we mentioned that uh, La Mouton uh, monopole from Domaine Long de Bequit, now owned by Albert Bichot. So typically today, the ground crews are harvested by hand because of the steepness of those slopes and higher density plantings uh, are also acquired along with lower yields. Uh, the Union de Grand Cru de Chablis controls roughly half the vineyards. And so there's a seal on the bottle that it's passed a tasting panel, essentially. 
Um, 785 hectare of Primer Cru, um, including 40 named Clemons, grouped into what they call 17 major Primer Crus. Smaller Primer Crus may co commonly label with their neighboring larger crew. Uh, major ones that you'll find on the right bank, of course, the Moff Nates Mayer, Mont de Milieu, and then Forchome. Uh, major Primer Crus on the left bank of the Saran, uh, you'll find Vaillon, Montmain. Of course, there are others that you will definitely need to know. Um, these are sort of the the most uh, pertinent ones that I've seen in the market. And I think it's also important to note um, that we we took a look at Montmain specifically, um, and we talked about smaller Clemont being allowed to label within as Primer Cru. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with certain Chablis producers, uh, Foray and Buteau are two of the best Clemots that you'll find. And those two can commonly label as simply Primer Cru, uh, but it's important to note that they lie within the region of Montmain. Pretty interesting. Um, other uh, wine growing regions sort of in the Yon department there, you find Iran C for Pinot Noir based reds, uh, Vezelay for 100% Chardonnay that was upgraded in 2017, and then of course uh, Saint Brie famously for producing Sauvignon Blanc in the Yon department. As we step away from, from Chablis, and I think you know perhaps we'll take a look later on when we get to Beaujolais and each of the crew individually, uh, it might be good to add to this presentation each one of the Grand Crew of Chablis and then talk about some great producers there within. Uh, but that's something that I'll let you all uh, dive into on your own. Uh, let's take a look at Coach Chalonais. You can see here just as we get south of Burgundy uh, on the flip side of where uh, Chablis was, you see the Salon River to the east of the region. Um, and the Chalon sur Salon here kind of area. Um, you notice here Marange in the north, Bouzeron, Ruy, Mercure, Givry, Montagny. Uh, pre predominantly red wine, about 60%, and then a big dose of white wine. Uh, only 25 kilometers long. Uh, the Cote Chalonnaise is built up mostly of weathered limestone and clay. Here you'll notice a lack of production excuse me, protection from cool westerly winds that really affects your ripening. We think about Burgundy to the north and those, those forests to the west that uh, blocks those cool westerly winds. It helps to encourage a bit more ripening. It became a, ge a geographic designation here in 1990, and it includes 44 communes for red, white, and rosé. Uh, the major village appellations though, uh, Mercure Montagny, followed by Rui Givry, and then of course, Bouzeron. Bouzeron being the lone village appellation that doesn't have a Primer Crew. And this is, of course, uh, the AOP for 100% Ali Cote. Uh, Rui produces both white and red from Chardonnay and Pinot Grigio and then Pinot Noir plus a handful of other things. Uh, Rui, though, is really known as the center for production of Cremant de Bourgogne. Uh, Mercure, with its almost 650 hectares, is easily the largest appellation in the region. It has 32 Primer Crews today after additions in 56 in 1988. Um, Pinot Noir based and can handle greater tannin and oak than the Cote d'Or. Uh, one benchmark monopole Primer Crew there is Clota Miglins by, by Fabley. And I think, you know, for those that have seen Mercury bottlings out there, probably have come across Fabley. <coughs> of course, a, a great negotiant producer. Uh, from both Burgundy, they produce Chablis, and then they're down in the Cote Chalonnaise as well. Um, they have a lot of land in Mercure, and traditionally they were pretty heavy handed on oak um, until really the sun took over in about 2007. Um, so you're seeing a little bit more uh, dialed back styles from them, and the wines are actually quite good these days. Uh, Givry, um, mostly red with some whites. They have uh, 38 Primer Crews in the area, and then of course Montagny for 100% Chardonnay in the area. So if you're looking for white only out of the Cote Chalonnaise, you need to point people toward Bouzeron for the Gote and Chardonnay from uh, Montagny. Uh, here's the, the map of the Mapinay. And here on the right, I have just sort of the Burgundy map, right? So we know Cote de Nui and Bone are in the north. Uh, we're gonna get to those two regions over the next few weeks. Um, and those will be very in-depth uh, presentations. It'll take quite a bit of time. Uh, I would suggest 45 minutes to an hour each day. Um, the Cote Chalonnaise, we sort of walked through here just south of the Cote de Bone. Um, and then now we get into Maconnais, which stretches across and actually 
bleeds over a little bit into Beaujolais as we get into that. You'll see sort of the major areas here that you need to pay attention to, of course, the city of Macon. Um, you'll find Ushizi, uh, Vera and Kles. Uh, of course, uh, then we get down here to where you'll find uh, Pierre Clos, Vergesson, Puy Fusse, um, Loge, Vincel, and Chantre. Uh, here's the, the Gilgsong map for this one, um, which I always like to take a look at. It shows you the city of Chardonnay here, and of course the big Sound River flowing just down the eastern portion of all of these regions. And then, if, it, it, interestingly enough, they, they put in Beaujolais down to the south here, and you can sort of see the overlap right here. Um, where if we say sort of straddles Saint Veron, but you also get some some Julien Saint Amour and Beaujolais AOP uh, overlapping here. Um, the Macanet is second in volume of white wines, only to Chablis, right? Um, so there's Chardonnay with a little touch of Gamay and Pinot Noir being produced there. Um, your Mac on AOPs, you can you can list reds, whites, rosés, including varietally labeled Gamay, which I always think is pretty interesting. About 85% of productions is Macon Village with 27 communes that are capable of appending. Um, a lot of the smaller ones, communes make red or rosé, but really only white wine may be labeled with the generic Macon Village. Important to note. A couple of things here, there's five village appellations that we, we sort of pointed out a little bit. Uh, Puy Fuise, Puy Loche, Puy Vincel, Samaran, and Viracles. Viracles. And those are all for Chardonnay only. Uh, and then within Puy Fuise, uh, includes four communes. Fuise, Solutre Puy, Vergesson, and Chantre. Uh, these vineyards sort of rise up the slopes below the rocks of Solutre and Vergesson, which are two limestone escarpments that define the landscape of Southern Mackinac. Um, we mentioned earlier, Saint-Veron is, is sort of split by Puy Fuise, and it totally rivals it in, in production. Uh, Vera Classe joins two communes really under one AOP uh, that was introduced in 1999. Uh, map of Beaujolais, of course, coming just south of the Cote Chalonnaise. It shows you all 10 of the crew, as well as the other AOP, which is this area just sort of outside of it. Um, and you'll find that, you know, the, uh, the majority of Nouveau wines come from down in the southern lower sloped areas here. Uh, but as for the most important aspects of Beaujolais, of course, the crew and the tin crew. And we're actually going to go uh, sort of in-depth on every single one of them. We're going to talk about uh, stylistically um, why they're all different. Great producers from the regions, maybe some of their soil types that we'll talk about here and here. Um, but another little cool map uh, that shows you really the closest city uh, to Beaujolais is, of course, Nyon. And you see, again, that Salon River that flows from the eastern side of all of these uh, major areas that meets up with the Rhone River right here as it cuts east and then heads down into the Rhone Valley, uh, which I think is interesting. Uh, so we mentioned that the closest city there is Lyon. It's also France's uh, third largest city. And really, uh, many believe it to be the, uh, the best food uh, city in all of France. That's debatable, of course, from across. Uh, I won't commit to saying one or the other, but a lot of people love the food from the area. 95% uh, of the area is, is planted in Gamay, with a little bit of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and actually 50% of the world's Gamay is planted here, which is a staggering number. It's fantastic. There are 11 AOP, uh, which we mentioned that sort of umbrella, Beaujolais AOP, followed by the Tim Crew. Uh, so most of your Beaujolais AOP and your Coteau Bourguignon AOP are grown in that flatter southern areas where granite really ceases and it becomes more clay limestone. So over half of the, the red wine produced in the south is Nouveau, which was first allowed by law in 1951, which of course is the famous wine that's re re uh, released on the third Thursday of every November. Uh, Beaujolais Village was rescinded and put under the, the Beaujolais AOP in 2011. It covers half the acreage, including all 10 of the crew and 38 total communes. It's slightly higher ABV requirements and lower yields. Uh, you can also append superior to any wine that's ABV is beyond the standard minimum. Uh, so 10.5% instead of 10%. Um, as far as just sort of generic uh, ways to remember your, your different areas of Beaujolais crews, I kind of broke them down into fruitiest, um, fruity with some structure and elegance, and then most structured. 
Um, and so the best way that I can find an acronym for is uh, the first one, BRC, Bright Red Cherries, right? So that's Bruy, Ranyi, and Chirouble. Those are considered to be your lightest, your brightest stylistic wines. Uh, fruity with some structure and elegance, Saint Amour Fleury, excuse me, Fleury and Chenoff, um, SA, SAFC, still a frickin' cherry. And then the most structured are Cote de Bruy, uh, Morgan, Julianos, and Moulin Um Can't really come up with an acronym there, so I just left it with where it is. Um, they all produce, excuse me, I just bounced. All produce only red wines. Um, here you have super high density and Gobelet trained, and most of them are hand harvested. Uh, your famous Ludi, um, Cote de P, I I think most of us are familiar with those from Morgon, uh, Le Capitan, less famous probably from Julianos, and then Le Madon and Fleury. And then the next couple of slides, we'll take a look at each individual crew, um, starting in the north with Saint Amour, of course, most northerly adjacent to Saint Veron. Uh, it's the only crew that's actually located entirely in the Sound at Loire. Uh, Julianos, possibly the most ancient growing region in Beaujolais, really high granitic hillsides of the Mount Basset. Um, 230 to about 430 meters in elevation, your co-ops, uh, Le Cave de Productios de Julianos, and then great producers here, Pascal Granger uh, and Domaine de Clos de Fief. Uh, next, Chinos, which is named for oak as the vineyards uh, sort of gradually replaced forests uh, up to about 240 hectare total today. Uh, they could actually bottle as either Chinos or Moulin Avant. Uh, Moulin Avant, of course, named for the windmill, uh, longest lived and most full bodied crew may see a noticeable amount of new oak, um, soft pink granitic soils here known as gore locally, possibly with a high amount of manganese. Great producers here, George de Bouffe, of course, the Negociant, uh, Louis Jadot's Chateau de Jacques, and then Potel Aviron. Uh, for Fleury, you see more pink granite, steeper slopes on the Mont Lamadon, uh, which can help you remember that, uh, 220 to 450 meters in elevation. Uh, the Louis Deeds of Poncy and Le Royette can really mirror great Moulin Avant here. They're highly floral and, and quite elegant. Great producers here, uh, Coudert's Clos Le Royette, Domaine de la Chapelle de Bois, and Domaine Chignard. Uh, Chirouble, as we mentioned, probably being the lightest uh, of all the crews and really intended to be drank in its youth is the highest elevation too, between 250 and 450 meters, and probably the coolest. Uh, Morgone is the second largest at 1,100 plus hectare. Uh, it's named after the hamlet, otherwise known as a town, and the center of it sprawls over the Cote de Pie and other hillsides. Here is where we'll find the famous Roche Puree, uh, otherwise known as Rotten Rock. It's a mixture of, of iron, schist, and basalt that are streaked with manganese. It's predominant on the coat itself. Uh, here is where you're also you're going to find the Gang of Four, right? Uh, the four producers, um, that have sort of put Beaujolais on the map for biodynamic uh, viticulture. Marcel Lapierre, uh, Jean Foyard, Jean-Paul Thevenet, and Guy Breton. And important to note that, yes, those are the gang of four. Where did they find their teachings, though? Um, I would hi highly encourage you to look up the readings, uh, the interviews with Jules Chauvet, who is very influential in each of their um, their careers and why they make wines in the way that they do. Uh, Renyi, which was elevated in 1988, has about 400 hectare of pink granite hillsides. Uh, your average elevation sits about 350 meters and really the southeasterly aspect makes for pretty early ripening. Bruy is the largest crew in the south. Um, it's the lower regions of Mont Bruy, which is an extinct volcano reaching up to about 484 meters if you think of brulee or creme brulee, right, you think of the burnt area, and that's sort of where Mont Bruy gets its name from. And then within the, uh, the Bruy area, um, to the south, you'll find Cote de Bruy, they're higher, they're steeper slopes of Mont Bruy. Uh, there's only 300 hectares, so it's less granite, more schisty, more gray-blue diorite, and your great producer for Cote de Bruy uh, is known as Chateau de Vin. So that's my show for today. I uh, hope you all appreciate um, the in-depth look at Chablis, uh, the Macon, the Cote Chalonnais, and Beaujolais. We will um, reconvene next week with, uh, I can't remember if it's Cote de Nuit or Cote de Bone first, but we've got them both 
lined up back to back. So we'll be uh, fighting our way through Burgundy here, as it were. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to, to send me a note. I'll get this published on YouTube uh, for anybody that wants to watch later on. Enjoy your Sundays, gang. Cheers.